Welcome everybody to our second QMUL Law Alumni Series Seminar for the 2021-2022 academic year. I'm Mario Mendez, a reader in law at QMUL and a QMUL Law Alumni myself. This series was conceived as a way for us to nurture our links with our alumni and keep us engaged with each other. After today's um, session, we have another alumni seminar taking place next month by Professor Eric Hines. The schedule for the new year has not yet been finalized, but our first speaker in January will be Dr. Fabio Giuffrida, who is now um, at the European Commission and a former QMUL law alumni and um, another confirmed speaker for um, the second half of the 2021-2022 academic year is Dr. Joe Merkins, a former QMUL law alumni and former member of staff who's now at the London School of Economics. You can see at the bottom of the uh, PowerPoint the URL that has the links for the videos for all the prior seminars that have taken place and will also include the links for the session taking place today in due course. Now turning to our seminar and speaker for today, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce my colleague Dr Saskia Hufnagel, who is Reader in Criminal Law at Queen Mary and co-directs our Criminal Justice Centre. Her topic today is protecting cultural property from plunder, criminal justice efforts to curb the market. Her main research areas encompass law enforcement cooperation in Asia, North America, the EU and Australasia, comparative constitutional and human rights law with a particular focus on terrorism legislation and the policing of art crime. She has published widely in these areas now we'll just highlight her new monograph published this year, Policing Global Regions, the Legal Context of Transnational Law Enforcement Cooperation. She is also a qualified German legal professional and an accredited specialist in criminal law. She will be well known to many of our alumni because she has taught on a number of LLM courses over the years, supervised many LLM dissertations, PhD students, as well as teaching and indeed convening our compulsory undergraduate criminal law module. Now, before passing the virtual floor to our speaker, a quick word on the format for today. Saskia will be speaking for somewhere between 25 and 30 minutes, and this aspect of the seminar will be recorded. We will then go to our Q&A session for around 20 or 25 minutes, and that aspect of the seminar will not be recorded. During the Q&A, the audience will be free to ask questions directly themselves and pop up on the screen to ask their questions um, or just indeed turn their mic on to ask questions. If you prefer, you can use the chat function in due course and I will read the question out. And indeed, you're welcome to pop a question into the chat function or via rather the chat function um, before we actually get to the Q&A session. Can I remind the audience to please keep their mics off during the presentation itself. Thank you very much. And Saskia, please do start when you're ready. Thank you so much. I'll just um, share my screen again. There we go. Can you see it? Yeah, wonderful. Then, um, I'd like to um, thank you for inviting me um, to give that seminar. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's great to see so many alumni, but also um, colleagues and friends um, and students um, gathered here, which is really nice to see. And um, I'm presenting today on a research project that I'm currently doing. So this is, um, it's not entirely work in progress because part of it has been finalized. So my research in particular on the jurisdictions of England and Wales um, that I present today has been, has been more or less finalized, but it's a comparative study with the German um, market. And um, so let me know at the end what you think. And I'm really looking forward to your comments. So what I really look at is um, what can criminal justice do to um, protect cultural property from plunder? And with plunder, I mean theft, I mean 
looting. And when I talk about looting, this is when archaeological treasures get um, dug up freshly from the ground or when art is stolen in a situation of war. Um, so so um, different faces of art theft and antiquities theft here um, that are included in the world word plunder. And then these items get stolen, they, they go somewhere else and they get sold usually in first world countries. We have a massive European market, we have a massive US market and hubs obviously um, are here, London, to talk um, about today. Now, criminal justice is generally tricky to apply when we think about the source countries, um, in particular when we think about looting and situations of war, there will be no criminal justice that applies in that country at the time. However, one might think that criminal justice is a very good means to curb the market um, where the items are finally sold. So when we think about London, there should be um, the policing of the market for such items. Um, and there should be criminal liability of, for example, sellers. So auction houses that knowingly sell plundered objects or galleries. There should be um, buyers um, that should be criminally liable, um, be they private, be they museums, be they collections or collectors. Um, and that's why I thought I start this study and I see what the criminal justice system actually does in these sort of market countries and whether it does anything really for that matter. So what is the problem? The problem is that we have a number of laws countering art and antiquities, theft, looting, trafficking, so bringing it from one country where it is stolen into another country, um, but they are very difficult to successfully apply. Um, even when those um, laws apply, um, the cases based on them often result in really minimal penalties, and that can be criminal or civil penalties, but we're talking here mainly about criminal penalties. And one component that dictates which laws can be applied or uh, successfully applied is the proof required for conviction. So I'll, I'll show you in a minute the different laws. They are all relatively different laws, but they all have in common that they have certain actus reus elements, so act elements. They have mens rea elements, which you will see is, is one of the main issues. Um, the knowledge that an item has been stolen, um, that a seller and a buyer in a market country need to have to be criminally liable. And so proving these is very difficult. And as prosecutions are very, very rare, um, so that's already showing you the result before we get to it, but um, it was to be expected that there are very rare prosecutions um, in relation to art theft, looting and trafficking. Um, one thing that needed to be done was to actually talk to um, the investigators um, and to the market itself. So because they would know why cases so rarely come to the attention of the criminal justice system. So I give you one example to start with, just to show you a little bit what I'm talking about when I'm talking about art, looting, theft, trafficking. And um, this example involves a very well-known um, Italian art dealer, Giacomo Medici. He was investigated for a very long time, and he was investigated for a very long time, not only by the police, but even more, he was brought down by 
scholars. So um, professors, archaeology professors, and by um, partly also investigative journalists. So this is an interesting field here where we see that the policing is not only purely on the police, obviously because the police might have the least expertise in these matters, but that other um, people are taking it into their hands. And here, I think the driving force were academics to bring him down, which is nice to see that we can from time to time even be useful. Um, and the Euphronius crater um, is the example that I wanna show here. There's a brilliant piece written by Neil Brody on the Euphronius crater. Um, because this was, this was really his research. And um, what Giacomo Medici did could be very clearly shown on the example of this crater. So the crater had been stolen in Italy. So it had been, um, it had been dug out in Italy, probably after 1970. Um, 19 70 is like a magic word or a magic time in the art and antiquities um, protection because the 1970s UNESCO convention was concluded then. So the UNESCO convention wasn't really a criminal or didn't really force countries to introduce criminal laws. It was more civil law um, or administrative law measure. But this is where people see the start of um, protecting cultural heritage. And part of that is obviously protecting it through criminal law. However, in Italy, um, the unauthorized excavation of antiquities had long before the UNESCO convention in 1917 been an offense. It was an offense since 1939. And so here, um, it was it was protected it was definitely protected um, at the time when it was excavated so nevertheless the claim was um, it was uh, dug up much later the crater was exported to switzerland switzerland was the transit country and here the crater became new documents so it was basically laundered um, it became, it, it got a false provenance and all the documentation was basically beautifully forged. So the legal identity um, became, uh, well, it became, it, it got a legal identity here. And then it was sold um, from Switzerland to um, the Metropolitan Museum. The papers attached to it said that it had been out of Italy since at least the 1920s. So the um, thieves were aware of the 1939 law um, and the customs forms would have listed then Switzerland as the country of origin and not Italy anymore. This is a very normal, this is a very usual thing. You will find in a lot of cases that were investigated that um, they were rooted through a country, got new documentation, and then became legal, so were laundered. This is very different from what we know from other illicit markets or illicit items. So with drugs or with illicit weapons, that would always be, they would always be illicit, whereas a piece of art can, or an antiquity can be illicit and become licit. Um, and the possible parallel that has so far been drawn is the trafficking of blood diamonds. And um, it's very easy to launder these kind of items. So this is just one example. So you get an idea of what happens to items when they move from A to B and how easy it might be to do this. Anyway, Giacomo Medici was, was caught and um, so that was one of the success stories. So the approach of my study is basically first to identify Cree criminal laws that relate to art and antiquities, theft, looting and trafficking. 
And you will see there's a surprising amount of them um, just in England and Wales. Um, I've been looking at the language of these laws to see um, what the proof requirements are. So what do we need um, in terms of actus reus and mens rea elements and which might be the most difficult to prove. Um, I searched for criminal administrative and civil cases since the 1970s, so since the UNESCO Convention came into force, and I looked for them basically, I started with the criminal when I couldn't find much, I went on to administrative and civil commercial cases, and I actually found some cases there that dealt with crimes that could not be prosecuted. So even looking at those cases is really interesting because they contain information as to why some cases are not prosecuted. To search those cases, I use specific keywords. So art theft, stolen antique, antiquity, statue, and painting. And I reviewed and analyzed cases um, for discussion of the burden of proof and how it was applied. There weren't, unfortunately, there were unfortunately not that many. Then I conducted interviews with police, customs, art market um, practitioners to get more information on potential cases that hadn't been prosecuted and why those cases weren't prosecuted. So these are all cases that obviously would make it into the statistics or would never make it into the state law. They would make it into the police statistics, but the police statistics, unfortunately, do not separate art from other property crimes. So it's really tricky to do research um, specifically on art crime cases and antiquities. Then, um, what are the key laws in England and Wales? Well, the most, the most general ones are, of course, the Theft Act. So anything that is stolen, and it doesn't matter whether something is looted, so dug up out of the ground, freshly excavated, or whether it's stolen from a museum or a private home, the Theft Act would apply. The Fraud Act, I include it because the Fraud Act is relevant to the forging of documentation, for example. Um, so the laundering of objects would fall under the Fraud Act. Um, Proceeds of Crime Act, obviously the laundering of an object is also money laundering. Um, so that is very relevant. Customs and Excise Management Act, which is the import of a looted item into the country, and then the Export Control Act for the export of an item. Then we have a surprising number of specialized laws that some of you might have not heard of yet. And there's the Dealing and Cultural Objects Offenses Act of 2003. Um, there are no cases under that. Cultural Property Armed Conflict Act, which is relatively new and deals with um, items looted during times of armed conflict. The Treasure Act, um, which deals with items that are found. So think about metal detecting in um, Britain and um, when something is found, um, there's a very generous um, payment to the finders, so that's all in the Treasure Act. Then the Iraq UN Sanctions Order 2003, which is for um, items that are exported from Iraq. Um, Export Control Order Syria Sanctions, um, Export Control Syria Sanctions Order 2003, same for Syria. The Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act, which is the um, law that applies to particular, um, to particular um, parts of the country and the protection of monuments and archaeological sites. And interestingly enough, the Human Tissue Act, which includes um, human remains that are stolen and trafficked and that are sold, unfortunately, as art or artifacts. Then proof requirements, that's very 
basic, all criminal offences, um, the prosecution must prove particulars of the offence beyond reasonable doubt. Magistrates should only convict if they are sure of the defence guilt. And particularly tricky here is obviously the knowledge requirement. Yeah. So did the museum, when they bought the item, know that it was stolen? Then the um, for criminal penalties, um, there needs to be actus reus, mens rea. And the mens rea is here quite interesting because we all know that there's also situational liability. So um, crimes that do not actually have a mens rea requirement, which is something we should think about in the future for these offenses. And then we need a lack of defenses. Then England and Wales, um, what could we find here? There were overall 25 cases since 1970 that um, were dealing in looted, stolen art and antiquities. Um, only two of the criminal cases actually discussed particular proof requirements. So that wasn't a big problem here. 10 of the cases were criminal, 10 were civil, four administrative and one commercial. In all of these cases, the difficulty was generally proving mens rea, so proving the mental element, proving knowledge. And um, the other problem was proving um, all elements, even the actus reus elements in cross-border cases because um, the, as we see, we, as we saw in the Medici example, once an item has crossed a border in a transit country, got a different um, ID, got a different provenance, it's very hard to prove um, that people have um, knowledge. It's even hard to prove where it really happened. So policing perspectives, um, what do police say are the main issues of theft? The picture you see here is the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum after several major paintings from the collection were stolen. It's probably one of the biggest art thefts that ever happened. This one happened in Boston in the US in 1990. Um, and it's very sad to see, you see that the thieves here cut the paintings out of the frames and then just left the frames hanging on the wall bare. And that, that was left there as a reminder. Art theft is very difficult to police and a lot of cases don't hit the criminal justice system because a lot of thefts are not even reported to the police because there's little trust that the police can do anything to recover art. Um, there is therefore quite a high sort of private policing um, industry that has developed around these kind of things, um, which also comes with, with kind of a lot of problems. Um, the other reason why art thefts are not um, reported are because a lot of, um, people are not insured. So a lot of private um, people don't insure their paintings, but even museums don't insure their paintings. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, for example, does not insure its painting. In the US it's quite common because they said that the insurance would be so expensive that they couldn't acquire new paintings if they paid it. And so um, that's, that's the same for, for a number of, um, museums. Then a lot of these um, are inside jobs, so they are very difficult to police. Um, there's a, an Australian example from Franz von Mira's painting um, that was stolen, um, looking like an in-house job. Um, and also here in that example, we can see a lot of these are very rare, are very late only discovered. So the Franz von Mieris was missing for several days before people in the museum discovered that it was not hanging on the wall anymore. It was quite a small painting, but I don't think that is a brilliant excuse. Um, but um, when we think about archives, that becomes even worse. Where things that get stolen out of archives in the museum where every five years, um, people might go and sort of have a review the archive, 
um, to see what has been stolen. Um, things can be stolen for a very long time before it's discovered. And then police simply, there's, there's nothing that police can still do. So there are a lot of these problems um, related to art theft. Um, Art world is quite hesitant to cooperate with the police. Um, in the EU, there were some successful police investigations, which is why in some countries that attitude has recently changed. Um, but police are still reporting that there's, um, there's quite a hesitant attitude towards them in the art world. There are also the, the private investigators. One of the major ones is the art loss register. Um, which basically have a database for stolen items. Um, Art Loss Register is based in London. So um, it's very helpful in that way. It has a similar database to the Interpol database on stolen art. Um, but the problem here is that obviously their um, focus is different to the focus of police. Police want to convict offenders. The Art Loss Register wants to recover works of art, which means that they might not always um, contact the police when they do their job, which means the police do not um, get to do what they're supposed to do. So in a best world, um, the art loss register would find a painting, give it to the police, the police would give it back to the owner. But then of course the art loss register wouldn't make any money with it. So there's a, there's a clear issue here of um, different focuses or foci. Art then um, also has become a commodity and hence there is more con financial than cultural um, loss um, here and the police therefore have not as much interest in it um, as they would have in a major crime involving, for example, a human life or physical integrity. So um, we also need to see that. Um, and police don't have, um, here in the UK, it's different. Um, the Metropolitan Police has an art crime unit, and, um, but a lot of countries don't have that. So expertise is um, relatively low. Now, perspectives on looting um, in the source country, policing is really difficult. Um, the country might be at war, as I already said, there might be political unrest. This is a picture of um, illegal excavations. So these are all the craters where items have been illegally um, excavated. I think this was in Iraq. Um, and um, there might also be a lack of policing due to geographical remoteness. So you can't post police officers out in the desert all the time to monitor the sites. Um, there's under-resourcing um, and there's also uh, corruption that might facilitate that kind of um, crime. Then the trafficking, so the bringing of the items from the source into the final destination where they are um, sold um, is possible due to a number of reasons. Um, they can be lack of policing, they can be corruptions. There are examples of Cambodia where actually the military was actively helping thieves to transport um, items out of the country because they have heavy vehicles, so they could transport big statutes um, out of the country. Um, there's lack of knowledge um, when it comes to customs and um, police. And when it comes to customs in particular, when items go across borders, it's really important um, that they know what the items look like. So they are currently, um, the World Customs Organization is doing a lot of training in this field to show customs what is usually transported out of the country, what that looks like, and how to actually handle that item when they find it. So there's a lot done, but there's still a lot to be done as well. And then in market countries, it is um, really difficult to, um, to, to see um, whether something is actually stolen because when the documents are forged, 
it's very hard um, to prove that the buyer had knowledge. So um, there are loads of problems here in relation to looting. Now, a recent case and the last case that I'm going to show you is the Pandora Papers and the dealer Douglas Latchford. Um, the Pandora Papers here revealed offshore trusts that were used for illicit antiquity trade um, by Latchford. Um, Latchford always claimed that um, he rescued items from countries and he was particularly active in Asia, in Thailand, in Cambodia. And in Cambodia, he said he, he just rescued items that were um, that would have been used for target practice by the Khmer Rouge. So he was just get, getting them out of the country before they were destroyed. So he was he was one of the good guys. Um, Latchford was charged um, with trafficking and stolen and looted Cambodian objects by the Justice Department in the US in 2019, but then he passed away and so um, there was no prosecution. His daughter then said she wanted to return 125 objects worth 50 million US dollars to Cambodia, but um, it had been um, revealed that um, Latchford had done a deal with the Cambodian government that if he returned those objects, they would try not to, or they would protect him from prosecution. So it wasn't like a very um, generous gift that she was giving them. Plus they basically owned them. Um, and the problem that we are now facing in um, Britain is that he donated uh, loads of items um, to the MAT, to the British Museum, to the Denver Museum of Art. And so in all these museums, there are still these illicit items. And we now know that they were looted, stolen. Um, and what do we do with that? And I think from what I said, it would be really helpful to have a crime that is possession of an illicit object, which would make these items in the museum just, um, well, which would mean keeping them in the museum is a criminal offense. And um, so they'd have to give them back. So at the moment, they are just sitting there in the museums. Everybody knows they are looted, they are stolen, but there's nothing is really happening. They're, they are not being given back. So that's a, that's a situation that is quite tricky. And I think the criminal law is very limited here. Obviously we have civil law possibilities to do something, but I think we could also think about the criminal law um, doing something here and making the purchaser um, or giving the purchaser an incentive to do the right thing. So um, in conclusion, um, not all cases that I found um, discuss evidential issues. Um, so um, we can't really see much from the case law that we found, it's much more interesting to look at the investigations and to listen to police and prosecutors and art market participants as to why investigations do not happen. Um, transnationality is a major issue, why cases can't be prosecuted, um, the obscurity of the market is a major issue. We could think about the reversal of the burden of proof um, so that it's actually on the owner to prove that the item is legal rather than the other way around. I don't really think that will happen, but we could also think about reducing possession offences that don't require mens rea to put some pressure on um, the sellers, buyers and middlemen who deal with these items. Thank you very much.